All right, we'll get started, everybody. So, good morning. I think everybody here knows me. I'm John Morrell, one of the fourth year residents here, and talk about superficial bladder cancer. So, our objectives uh, first of all, just to review the basics, etiology, natural history, some of the conventional treatments that we use. And then also we're going to take some time, or probably the bulk of the time, going over some of the newer therapeutic strategies that are being developed uh, to treat superficial bladder cancer. Uh, like I said, we'll look at the etiology, the pathology, natural history, some prognostic factors, um, and then conventional treatments, and the new treatment strategies. So first off, uh, etiology and risk factors. This is straight out of Campbell's. This is for the guy's exam. Cyclophosphamide is the biggest risk factor, relative risk of nine, smoking, a little bit down the list at four, and then a bunch of other pelvic radiation, occupational exposures. The main, um, the key ingredient in occupational exposures tends to be aromatic amines. Um, also, schistosomiasis infection, primarily associated with squamous cell, but also is associated with TCC. Um, some of the rare ones, blackfoot disease, renal transplantation, low fluid intake, Chinese herb nephropathy, chronic cystitis. Um, in terms of pathology, classification. In 1998, uh, the World Health Organization got together and came up with this classification. Um, divided up into three, hyperplasia, flat lesions with atypia, and then also papillary neoplasms. And the ones that we're going to be interested in, in are the carcinoma in situ and then the papillary neoplasms. Uh, at the same time, they uh, revised the grading system. The grading system that I think we see a lot of around here is probably the 1973 grading system where they have papillomas, grade 1, 2, and 3 tumors. Um, in 1998, they revised that and uh, switched over to the new one that you see on the right. And you can see where things sort of mapped out to in the new uh, classification system. They got P-U-N-L-M-T, that's uh, papilloma or of your, your, you know, Papillary urophilo neoplasia, neoplasia of low malignant potential. And then from there you have the low grade and the high grade. So looking at carcinoma in site too, uh, I see Dr. Jones is there. He's going to be the expert here, but I'll do my best. Um, CIS is it's a flat intraurophilo lesion, typically uh, characterized by increased cell layers and loss of polarity of the cell layers. And you get uh, big nuclei and you get an increased uh, nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Um, irregular nuclear outlines and uh, pleomorphism of the cells themselves. Uh, papillomas, these are just a stock of normal urothelium on a fibrovascular core. Uh, they're, they're totally benign. Survival there is 100%. They don't progress. And then moving down the chain, you get the papillary urothelial neoplasms of low malignant potential. Um, pretty much the same as the papilloma, except the urothelium is a little bit thickened. These guys do, uh, you know, as you can see there with the, the numbers, uh, there is a little bit of malignant potential, but it's low, as the name implies. And then there's the low-grade tumors. And with these, you get uh, loss of polarity of the cells, you get second urophilium, you start to get nuclear abnormalities and some uh, pleomorphism of the cell population as well. Uh, these do progress, uh, less than 10% of the time, though. And getting up to the high-grade stuff, uh, you get marked disorders, the, the, the nuclear are very different, um, cell populations, lots of pleomorphism, uh, the nuclei are big, take up a lot of space in the cell, you can have necrosis as well. Uh, these are the worrisome ones, they have a high propensity to, to progress in stage, depending on what you read, 15 to 40 percent in that range. So I'm trying to just drag it down, but can you just explain what the rationale is for changing the classifications that are coming up? Really yeah. My, my take on everything is that if you go back to the original staging, this, this grading system here, um, they were finding that grade two and three really didn't differentiate. Um, you could get a better, prog you could get better prognostic information, clear prognostic information, just giving it up into high grade and low grade. That's my take on it. Dr. Jones, do you have a different slide on it or? And then, and then the second thing was that uh, the grade two category, as the 
children are kind of wont to do, they put in a pre rate system and a bit of migration into that territory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all very uh, quite subjective. Um, and, and so they point to very good and take very care of the media. Um, I think the potential problem with the, with the new system, and uh, time will tell, I guess, is that we may be diluting the grade three. We do have specific treatment options that are aggressive that are reserving for grade three. Um, it's not really indicated when we just use the term high grade, as you can see, there are what we have to call grade two agents being chunked into the higher grade category. Yeah. But that's just a concern that I have because most of that is being done on a tabletop without. That is, it was discussion as, as opposed to having hard data to justify it. Hmm. So say, moving forward with this better, so-called better system, we'll be able to better uh, compare papers. Hmm. Okay. So that's, that's basically where it's at. It's a bit of a main game. Okay. And, and um, <coughs> as you saw in the illustration, it's very subjective difference in between Han Lam and 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 you know, and one or great low grade, you know, <coughs> and I would go ahead and mention that now. Okay. All right, thanks. So the tumors that we're, we're interested in when we talk about superficial or non-muscle invasive, um, it's the TA, uh, the TIS, and the T1. Um, all the other ones, the T2s and above, they're all muscle invasive and therefore not classified as superficial, so we won't be talking about those guys. Natural history, this is again right out of the book. Um, of newly diagnosed bladder cancers, about 55% of them are, are low grade and superficial, and then 45% of them are high grade, and of those 45%, you have about a quarter of them that are invasive right off the bat, and then 75% that are non-invasive and superficial. So it's that 55% plus the three quarters to 45% that uh, we're interested in today. The majority do develop recurrences. 25% um, of those that do recur end up recurring at a higher grade. And then 10% uh, of those that we sure end up progressing in stage to muscle invasive disease. Uh, risk factors for recurrence, progression, mortality. Um, this is a little bit different from what's in Campbell's um, that probably a lot of us are familiar with. These, this is clinical factors only, and this is the best data that I could come across. Um, this is Millen Rodriguez et al. It was published in 2000, and they looked at just over 1,500 patients that had uh, primary TA to T1 superficial disease that were treated with a classic resection of the bladder tumor. And then also they had random biopsies. Uh, as you can see there, they biopsied the trigone, the rectal trigone, the lateral wall, the dome, the prostatic urethra. This was all normal appearing urethra. Um, of those patients, about a third of them had intracycle therapy of some sort uh, during the follow-up. The key thing here is they did a multivariate analysis, which a lot of the other um, risk factor studies hadn't done. So they came up with some different results. Um, follow-up was the usual. The need of follow-up schedule was a little bit uh, different from what we would do. They did cysto in cytology, alternating with ultrasound cytology every four months for a couple of years. Um, and then six months afterwards, IDT sprinkled in there to, to watch for upper tract uh, disease. Their mean follow-up was only four years. Endpoints, they looked at progression, uh, recurrence, and also uh, disease-specific survival. The specific factors they looked at were grade stage CIS uh, in the random biopsies, multiplicity of the tumors, and tumor size greater than three centimeters, whether there's displays in the biopsy, and then whether they had uh, intracycle therapy. So first of all, looking at recurrence, um, they found that multiple tumors, a big tumor, high grade, and whether they had intracycle therapy or not, um, had an impact on recurrence. But then when they did the multivariate analysis, they came up with the fact that only a um, multiplicity of tumors, a size greater than three, and the uh, presence of CIS in the, in the biopsies, those were the only ones that had an independent uh, um, effect on the uh, recurrence of the tumors. And looking at progression, um, same thing on, on the, uh, the Kaplan-Meier analysis, multiple tumors, size and grade all had uh, an effect on progression. And then in the multivariate analysis, uh, multiple tumors, Big size, greater than three centimeters, and presence of CIS. Those had an independent effect on tumor progression. The big one was grade three uh, uh, pathology. That had a big odds ratio of uh, approaching 20. Um, disease specific survival, again, the same thing. High grade CIS came out, but then on the, the multivariate analysis, uh, 
grade 3 pathology or CIS were the only independent factors. Some of the conventional treatments, these are the ones we're familiar with, uh, transurethral resection of the bladder tumor, plus or minus uh, site selected biopsy. I don't think anybody around here does that too often that I've seen anyway. Um, you can laser ablate the, the lesions. You can just go straight to a cystectomy and um, the odd time. Um, Intravesical chemotherapy, not too often used around here that I've seen, and then intravesical BCT, which is commonly used. And so looking, looking at the resection indications to treat bladder tumors and also to get staging and uh, prognostic information. Some of the indications for biopsy, these are controversial, um, but from the book anyway, they say you should uh, biopsy any suspicious area. If you're planning to do a partial cystectomy, you need to make sure there's no CIS. Uh, and if you've got high-grade cytology, but only low-grade uh, or papillary tumors, then CR, doing biopsies is also an option just to make sure there's not widespread CIS accounting for your high-grade cytology. Um, TORBT, unfortunately, is, is inadequate. If you look at the numbers, 50% of people that have a TORBT end up having a recurrence within five years. And if you go at 10 years, it's up to 80%. Um, and 25% of those people with superficial disease end up going on to require more aggressive radical therapy despite the fact that they've had a TORBT. So, not great. Uh, looking at coastal biopsies that we were just talking about before, uh, the, the biggest series that I found was by May, uh, published in the European Journal of Urology 2003. Uh, they looked at uh, 905 consecutive patients that had superficial disease uh, with a tumor greater than one centimeter. And they did random mucosal biopsies. And in those random biopsies, they found cancer in 12%. Uh, based on the mucosal biopsies, their patients were upstaged 7% of the time. And 7% of the time, because of the findings on the mucosal biopsies, patients went on to more uh, aggressive treatment, DCG, a repeat TOR, or cystectomy. Um, so small numbers, but I guess something to think about. Laser ablation, I don't know how useful this really is. Uh, you can coagulate the lesions and obliterate them, but uh, you don't get any tissue for pathology. So it's probably not a useful thing, especially the first time around when the patient presents for the first time with their, their, their primary tumor. Um, one small study, though, did find there's no difference in recurrence compared to CURBT. Cystectomy, uh, it, it's an option in certain situations, according to channels anyway. If they've got multiply recurrent disease that's rendering the, the bladder uh, non-functional from scarring, then it's, it's an option. They have high risk disease that's refractory to a couple of cycles of DCG, then cystectomy is an option then. And it's also an option uh, in high-grade disease, T1 disease right off the bat, because it's known that those people, a lot of the time, progress. So the idea is you get them before the cat gets out the door. Intracycle chemotherapy, a lot of agents have been looked at, Biotipa, Doxorubicin, Epirubicin, Zalrubicin, Mitomycin. Typically these things are given weekly, kind of like DCG, given over 48 weeks. Um, you started with, classically they've been started at least a week after TORBT because they've been worried about um, absorption from the bladder. Results haven't been very good though, very small decreases in recurrence rates, a bit less than 50% for all of these. Um, some demonstration though of ablative activity on this existing tumors if you can't completely resect them all when you do your TRBT. <coughs> Inadequate though, uh, Dr. Lamb looked at uh, 22 series, close to 4,000 patients that were randomized with IV chemo, or intracycle sorry, chemotherapy versus TRBT alone. Uh, they looked at all the classic uh, intracycle agents. Um, the average decrease in incidence, so like I said, at two years was, was only 14% uh, drop in recurrence. Um, and there was no advantage over the long term. And also progression data from the 2,000 patients that they had progression data on showed that there was really no difference in the progression uh, versus just straight recession all by itself. Um, Intravesical BCG, um, stem from camels here, it, the gold standard remains the most effective intravesical treatment for uh, superficial disease. Um, it's effective in treating CIS and treating residual papillary tumors if you can't technically, you know, respect it. Um, and it's also effective in preventing recurrence of superficial disease. From the basics, uh, BCG is a tenuous strain of Mycobacterium bulbus. Uh, it's not Mycobacterium tuberculi, which is the one responsible for tuberculosis. The mechanism and action is not completely uh, known, but it's figured to be immune mediated through uh, Th1 cell. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, okay. They're both, they, when you get your BTC, they both come in there? I see, okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of administration, this is something we don't see around here. It's all done by some oncologist somewhere, but when I was in Ontario, I was involved in doing this. And BCG, it comes with a little powder in a vial, and you got to reconstitute it with like 50 cc's or so of normal saline. Um, you put a catheter in, you mix up your BCG, you're supposed to do it in a fume hood and wear gloves and gown and masks and all that. Um, put it in the bladder, take out the catheter, and then tell the patient to sort of squish it around and hold it in the bladder for a couple of hours and then go pee. Uh, you should evaluate the response at three months by doing the cystal and, and biopsies. And uh, the recommendation is that you can repeat it once if you have a failure, if there is still disease on your repeat bi or biopsy and cystal. But every time you go on and repeat the course of BCG, you're risking progression. So that's why they recommend repeating only once. And then if, if they fail then, then you should call them a failure and, and move on to more aggressive treatment. Indications, uh, I think of them as primary adjuvant and prophylaxis. Primary treatment of CIS. Adjuvant treatment if you can't get the whole tumor out uh, transurethrally. And then prophylaxis gains recurrence of T1 disease. Uh, prophylaxis gains recurrence of high grade TA disease that's recurrent. And then also multifocal disease. Efficacy, um, initial tumor free response rate around uh, 75%. Compared to TURBT alone, you get a 40% reduction in recurrence. Um, and then compared to the intravesical chemotherapy, it's much better, two-fold improvement in recurrence. Um, interesting number is the number you need to treat. You need to treat 3.3 people to prevent one recurrence. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is far better than any of the intravesical agents, and that's why it's become the gold standard. It, is, uh, it does have its limitations, so 70% end up getting a recurrence or a progression despite the fact that they've had a you know, complete course of BCG. You also get systemic side effects from it. Uh, you know, right, we're all familiar with these. Um, they're from as mild as a little bit of irritated abortion system to BCG sepsis. Um, the big limitation though is no effect on overall survival or death due to bladder cancer. Some mar marginal alternatives. Um, just mentioning just to be complete, intracycle interferons, interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, uh, the keyhole limpet, hemocyan, and these ones have all been looked at but shown to be uh, useless. So this is my halfway point. Slow it down, I guess. Um, so now the bulk of the talk is on the complementary methods to pre prevent recurrence. Uh, you can divide this up into four things. You can macroblade the tumor, prevent reimplantation of tumor cells, microablation with uh, chemotherapy, and then prophylaxis. So first off, looking at macroablation, we'll, we'll talk about repeating the QRBT and then also uh, using some, uh, some equipment that can help better visualize the tumor so that you do a better job of resecting it in the first place. Uh, looking at repeat QRBT, um, the best and the most current series is from Graham's Journal of Urology in 2003. Um, the rationale for this study was that uh, for big tumors, high-grade tumors, 30% of the time, if you uh, repeat the QRBT, it was found that uh, they'll often have uh, either residual tumor or they'll be upstaged based on the results of the, the repeat QRBT. <coughs> Interesting fact, uh, at least in Europe anyway, the rate of residual tumor is independent of surgeon experience. So, way to go resonance. Um, and in this particular study, they looked at 124 patients that had superficial disease. They, all these patients, or sorry, 78, 78 of them got a repeat resection about seven weeks later, and then 36% of them had no repeat resection. Uh, the two groups were um, dissimilar, though. The, the patients that had the repeat QRBT tended to be the, the higher stage, the higher grade tumors. The 36 that had no QR, repeat QRBT, they were small tumors, solitary tumors, low grade. So already the, the results are going to be skewed towards favoring um, uh, recurrences or favoring lack of recurrences in the, uh, the no QRPT group. So keep that in mind. Um, they found that tumor grade was the only independent factor predictive of residual tumor. And then when they did a Kaplan-Meier five-year recurrence free survival, they found that 63% uh, of the, the patients that had uh, uh, the repeat QRPT were recurrence free versus only 40% in the QRPT alone group. And uh, keep in mind that that 40%, that group there, they had low-stage, low-grade tumors to begin with. 
Um, this five amino levulinic acid, this is something that's being investigated in Europe and a couple places in North America. I'd say from the premise that conventional cystoscopy, you'll miss essentially up to a third of tumors. So uh, how this works is you appreciate the bladder with the 3% solution of this stuff. It's 5 amino levulinic acid. You give it two to three hours free treatment. Um, this 5 ALA business, it's a, uh, it's a heme pre precursor. When it gets absorbed in the bladder, one of its metabolites, uh, protoporphyrin 9, it accumulates in the, in, in the tissues. And it tends to accumulate in tumor tissues, first normal tissues, at a ratio of 17 to 1. And this stuff fluoresces under uh, violet light in the, the 400 wavelength uh, range. And you can get this, this, this special light. You can get it from source. It's a xenon lamp. And you just put a special filter on it and you get the, that particular wavelength out. Um, so they looked at 301 patients that underwent CURBT, either just the standard with the white light and the, the respective scope, or else with the, the pre-treatment with the 5 ALA and then the blue light. Uh, all of them got a repeat CURBT a few weeks later. Um, all of them got follow-up white light cystoscopy and cytology three months thereafter, as per the usual surveillance protocol. And at six weeks, they found that the patients that had the, the white light uh, Cisto and QRBT, um, they had residual tumor 25% of the time versus the, the people with the 5 ALA and the blue light Cisto and QRBT, they only had residual tumor 5% of the time. And uh, the short term occurrence free survival, 9% in the, the, the blue light group and 66% in the white light group. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Another thing we can do to prevent recurrence is to prevent reimplantation. Uh, there's some evidence, mostly molecular evidence, that uh, suggests that uh, recurrent tumors, both uh, synchronous and metachronous tumors, uh, they're all of formal origin. So um, the thought is that some of the recurrences, the early recurrences anyway, are, are due to reimplantation of tumor cells that get scattered around when you're doing your QRBT. Um, there have been multiple studies that have shown efficacy of, of uh, doing intraglycycle chemotherapy right after uh, you do your QRBT with minimal side effects. Uh, the, the best and the biggest series is from Foley is way back in 1996. Uh, he had uh, 452 patients with uh, superficial disease. Um, three groups, you had QR alone group versus a QR plus immediate uh, mitomycin C intraglycycle and then a third group that had the QR and mitomycin C immediately within 24 hours and followed by an additional um, four installations spread over the next year. They used 40 milligrams and 40 milliliters of, uh, of saline given into the bladder. It was given within 24 hours and the patients had to retain it for 60 minutes. And they got long follow-up here, seven years. Um, toxicity they didn't really document it other than saying it was well tolerated and there really weren't any lower urinary tract symptoms reported. And this is what the results look like. Um, top line here is the, uh, the mitomycin C group with the four additional post QRBT installations beyond the immediate one. And then the lower line here is the single post operative mitomycin installation. And the lower line is just the control with QRBT alone. So you can see that. Um, you get the best results by, by giving the five uh, installations. You get a decrease in insurance by about 6% as you approach the, the end of their follow-up at uh, five, six, seven years. A single installation gives you protection of about 34%. Uh, looking at progression, uh, earlier on, uh, really not much effect. As you're starting to get out in the long term, there's a trend towards decreased progression, but uh, they had insignificant or insufficient numbers really to make a, a firm conclusion on progression. Um, same thing with overall survival. And then microablation, this is a technique to uh, prevent new tumors from, from forming. And the things we'll talk about is uh, steps to enhance the chemotherapy regimens that we already have and also steps to enhance the uh, uh, immunotherapy regimens that we already have. Um, the things you can do to optimize the pharmacology of the, the chemotherapy agents that, that are given uh, these sort of all revolve around uh, increasing the concentration of the, of the, the agent in the bladder. So you can do things like induce relative dehydration, remove all the residual urine before you put in your chemotherapy, um, 
decrease the volume that you dilute your chemotherapeutic agent in. Um, <coughs> increasing urina urinary pH by oral alkalinization. This has been shown to improve the stability of mitomycin C. So uh, this group O uh, published re results in 2001. They had a five-year disease-free rate of 41% uh, in the group that they did all these things in versus 25% uh, in the group that just got the standard uh, intravesical installation. Um, Combining chemo with synergistic technology, these are things that are sort of new and out there and, and being developed right now in isolated centers, but worth talking about because they, they may, uh, you know, they might get more attention in the future. Intravisical chemotherapy combined with uh, hyperthermia and then also pretty fancy electromotive driven intravisical mitomycin C. Let's talk about those. So looking at the hypothermia, this is based on the, the laboratory observation that tumor cells are um, sensitive to hypothermia. So based on this, uh, Colombo devised, devised this, uh, this study, a prospect of randomized, was multi-centered. Um, they looked at primary or recurrent superficial disease, and uh, all the patients got a complete transurethral resection. They excluded the, uh, the low grade, so the low risk tumors, the TAG ones. Um, two groups, 41 got uh, mitomycin C, and then 42 got uh, mitomycin C plus hyperthermia. Um, they all got eight weekly sessions and then four monthly sessions for maintenance. The hyperthermia was delivered via a transurethral um, microwave apparatus. I, I couldn't, get, couldn't find a picture of it, but it's some sort of an apparatus that fits up through a big receptoscope and it's got a microwave generator on the end and it's got some tentacles to go out and touch the bladder wall and make sure that you're actually getting hyperthermia in the bladder wall. Um, so they did find that uh, when they did apply this microwave generator, they, they did get hyperthermia, 42 degrees, plus or minus a couple degrees. Um, their follow-up was a couple of years, and their primary outcome was recurrence free survival. What they found was that uh, recurrence at 24 months in the hyperthermia group was only 17% versus the, the standard group, which just had the QRBT, or sorry, the mitomycin C alone, their recurrence rate was 58%. Um, side effects were some lower urinary tract symptoms immediately afterwards, but none of these were long term, and there was no significant difference between the two groups. Uh, as I mentioned, there it's just two year data, so long term data is, is going to be needed before this uh, you know, can even be considered to, to add to BCG or replace BCG. The next uh, one for the 21st century is electromotive mitomycin C. Um, this is based on, again, another lab observation that uh, G3, T1 tumors might require higher concentrations of uh, chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, then you can get just by passive diffusion. So uh, the physics here is you apply a current across the bladder wall and you get, uh, mitomycin C is not an ionized um, molecule, so it doesn't slow down an electrical gradient, but the, uh, the current does cause a, like a water current to move, and then the mitomycin C just to drag down the uh, right down the river, so to speak, deeper into tissues. Um, there's been a prospect of randomized trial here done in Europe. Um, they had 108 patients, all again with superficial disease, either TIS or uh, TA to T1 disease. Three groups here, which is good. It's sort of a, a good study because they looked at the gold standard, which is uh, BCG. So the three groups, uh, the first group got standard mitomycin C, 40 milligrams and 40 mils in the bladder. Um, the second group got the 40 milligrams of mitomycin C, but with this electromotive push behind it with a 20 milliamp current. And then the third group, which was the, uh, the gold standard the BCG. Um, they got six weekly treatments, and then the, the non-responders got an additional uh, six weeks. And responders got, went on to get a, a maintenance uh, regimen, monthly uh, installations for 10, uh, 10 months. It was well tolerated. Uh, there were more adverse effects in the BCG group than any other group. And the results, um, small numbers. Uh, really, the only thing that came out to be significant was the, the median time to recurrence, which was fairly significant. Um, in the electromotive group, I don't know if it's that clear here for you, but um, 35 months was the median time to recurrence in the uh, electromotive minus mycin C group versus, I think, it was 19 months there for the, just a straight by itself mitomycin C versus, I think that's 26, yeah, 26 months for the, the BCG. So, you know, I think the, the comparison that you're interested in is the BCG versus the electromotive mitomycin C. It's, 
potentially show some problems, but more data is needed here. Looking at some alternative chemotherapy of regimens, this is uh, different agents and different combinations of agents. And as you can see, none of these things have been effective. Uh, the other standard ones, the platin, mitovantrone, topicized, leomycin, methotrexate, 5-FU, and various combinations and permutations of all these things have been tried. And none of them have shown to be effective at all. Uh, I do want to know intracycle with gemcitabine. This has uh, been shown to have, uh, with metastatic disease, to have a protein equal efficacy compared to the standard MVAC. So based on that, they decided to try this intracycle. There's only phase two results so far. Um, I don't know how they got approval to do this, but they took 39 patients and that had multiple tumors, and they did a complete resection of all the tumors, but left one behind as a marker lesion. And then they turned around and gave these patients two grams of gemcitabine into the cycle uh, weekly for six weeks, and then went back and did a repeat TUR uh, two weeks after they completed their, their course of the intracycle of gemcitabine. Um, complete response in 56% and stable use in 44%. So potentially some promise. Maybe it'll take over from metamycin 10 years from now or ECG. We'll never know. Uh, Intravacycle stearamine, another sort of new agent that's out there and potentially coming down the pipe. Very early studies only so far. Um, all that's really been found is it's got a safe dose identified and they're now moving on to phase two studies. So more on that probably in a few years. Jumped ahead here somehow. Okay, mistletoe lectin. Um, <laughs> I included this just because that seems to be, uh, uh, you know, it's the, not the trend, but it's the culture. People like to use herbals and like to avoid fancy chemicals made by doctors as much as they can. So this came up in my lecture, so I thought it was interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, 45 patients with uh, TA low-grade tumors. These are patients that uh, typically wouldn't get any intravacycle. Is this somebody we should know? or <laughs> So, yeah, um, they took 45 patients with, with low risk disease, TA, low grade tumors. These are patients that normally wouldn't get anything other than just a TURBT. Um, and they randomized them to TURBT versus TURBT plus subcutaneous mistletoe lectin. And uh, conclusion, no effect on time of recurrence, no effect on number of recurrences. So when your patients come in begging for mistletoe lectin, you can quote this study and tell them it's useless. And then looking at immunotherapy enhancement, um, things that have been looked at are maintenance and reinduction regimens of BCG, dose reduction strategies, and combination BCG plus other immune modifiers. First of all, looking at the maintenance regimens, um, this guy Lamb is pretty prolific uh, with bladder, superficial bladder cancer. He's, he's got the best series on maintenance and reinduction. Um, based on the, the previous findings and observations, the second week, uh, sorry, second six week course of BCG will often do complete response in, in about half of the patients, or up to half of the patients that don't get a primary response with the first go of BCG. Uh, this was SWAG study 8507, if you want to look it up. Uh, they looked at maintenance versus no maintenance. Five and a half hundred patients with CIS or recurrent TA, T1 disease. Um, they all got um, induction with BCG one week following their TURBT, the classic, for six weeks. And the maintenance group then went on to have a, a three week uh, maintenance cycle uh, multiple times at three months, six months, 12, 18, 24, and 30 and 36 months. Um, 
patients received uh, both standard intracycle BCG and then percutaneous BCG. Uh, this percutaneous business is not something that's, I think, commonly done anymore, um, but it's what Dr. Morales and Kingston first described when he was first coming up with this whole idea of giving people BCG. And what it's all about is you clean up the thigh a little with some alcohol and then apply a smear of, of uh, BCG to the thigh and you poke some holes in the skin and let the stuff get in that way. Um, benefit, utility, or futility of this except it hasn't been looked at, but it's, I think primarily been abandoned because people figure it's, it's useless and it's an extra step and uh, not done. But anyway, just for the sake of completeness, this group um, uh, gave them the percutaneous BCG just to be consistent with what had originally been described. Looking at the recurrence-free survival, um, median recurrence-free survival in the maintenance group was 77 months versus 36 months. And another way to look at it, percent five-year recurrence free survival is 6% in the maintenance group versus 41 in the no maintenance group. Uh, another all, another strategy, not so much to um, get better outcomes with respect to uh, cancer control, but just to decrease the toxic effects of BCG or dose reduction strategies. And these studies have been undertaken primarily because the doses that are currently used, the 81 milligrams, it was never subject to any, you know, dose finding studies. Um, I don't know exactly how they came up with 81 milligrams, but it wasn't all that scientific, I gather. So there have been several trials to look at lowering the doses. And again, like I said, the goal was really to maintain the, the cancer control activity, but to decrease the toxicity of the stuff. Uh, the biggest study from Europe uh, in BJE 2002, 500 patients, all superficial disease, randomized, um, either to the standard uh, BCG of 81 milligrams versus the 27 milligrams after the complete PR resection. Um, they're scheduled, they got weekly BCG for six weeks, and then um, every two weeks for six weeks after that, they had a pretty good follow up, 70 months. What they found uh, in terms of cancer control, there was uh, no difference in time to recurrence, uh, no difference in progression uh, freeness at five years, and there was no difference also in overall survival. And the big thing is there was significantly less toxicity in the dose, re group, dose uh, reduced group. Uh, numbers were too small though to see this trend for sure, but there was a trend towards um, decreased recurrence and progression in the standard dose group. So, you know, there's probably more studies are needed here, but what maybe will come out in the long term with more patients, if more patients get approved of these kinds of studies, that you'll find that um, the dose-reduced regimens are maybe safe for the lower-risk patients, but the high-risk patients with high-grade disease, T1 disease, maybe are going to be better treated by um, the standard regimen of 81 milligrams. Combination strategies, this is um, using DCG plus uh, other immune modu modulators. Um, Interferon or IFN uh, alpha is uh, the one that's been studied the most. Um, BCG and IFN alpha have been shown to be potentially synergistic in lab models. Um, uh, preliminary results suggest that the combination, you, you might get some improved efficacy over BCG, but very short term studies. Um, the author suggests that maybe what will come out is that it might have a role in people who have failed BCG and aren't really candidates for a more aggressive disease or more aggressive treatment like a cystectomy. And then lastly, looking at uh, prophylaxis, simple things, smoking cessation, dietary modification, um, with vitamin supplements, increased food intake, and studies on all these things. Um, looking at smoking cessation, uh, we all know that smoking is a big risk factor. Um, late recurrences can result from continued exposure to uh, the carcinogenic agents. And as we know, like I said, smoking is probably the largest single risk factor in, in most patients that are seen. And um, it's known that those that continue to smoke have the highest risk for recurrence and progression. At least that was, that's a common uh, belief. So uh, in this study, they did a systematic review of all the evidence that uh, looked at smoking cessation. They have identified 15 studies. Um, only three of them are really um, any good in terms of looking at prognos prognosis if they quit smoking versus whether they continue smoking. Only one of those studies was actually of, of any high quality. Um, so all papers sort of came to the conclusion that quitting does decrease recurrence rate, but the evidence for all this is very weak. So uh, I, I guess considering the fact that the evidence for quitting smoking is weak, 
plus the fact that getting people to stop smoking is pretty difficult and stop or smoking cessation programs are expensive and hard to administer. These authors uh, suggested that uh, you may be wasting your time trying to get these people to, to quit smoking. Um, maybe the smoker himself or has shares or something. And then dietary modifications. Um, it's well known that diets rich in fruits and vegetables and fiber and all that have the lowest risk for all cancers. Um, high fat diets tend to increase the risk. So this uh, potentially is useful in preventing uh, new bladder recurrences. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that it has any effect on recurrences once you've had a primary tumor. Vitamin supplementation. Um, there's a study from about 10 years ago by this guy Lamb. Um, they did a randomized trial. They, they gave people mega doses of vitamin A, C, E, uh, B6, and zinc versus a standard uh, uh, multivitamin that you can get over the counter. Uh, they found a significant benefit in uh, maintaining people disease free with the mega doses. But the problem is it was a small study and um, and I guess in light of some of the evidence that's come out recently, the high doses of vitamin E with cardiovascular effects, but maybe this is not a worthwhile thing to be pursuing. Um, increased fluid intake. Um, uh, increased fluid intake has been shown to decrease the, like the primary incidence or the incidence of primary tumors in men. Um, this group here did a prospect evaluation of the effect of fluid intake on recurrent tumors. They had uh, 267 patients. At each follow-up, the patient did a uh, fluid intake questionnaire, and they had a minimum of two years follow-up, which is short, but to start. This is what they found. There's no difference at all in, uh, in the fluid intake in the patients that had recurrences versus uh, the patients that had uh, no recurrences. So, summary here. Um, majority of tumors that, that come in the door are superficial, which is good. Um, However, you do get a significant number that will progress in stage and go on to need more aggressive, more morbid uh, treatment. Uh, we've looked at how the fact that uh, current treatments are inadequate, um, and we look at some newer things that can potentially decrease your current. Uh, key thing to emphasize, though, is none of these new things that we've talked about really have any effect on progression or survival. The only effect is on uh, reducing the current. So there's still lots of work to be done here. And some points for discussion, some things that I want to talk about maybe just with the group is uh, how many people are doing VPT or RBTs routinely, who's using post-op, mitomycin C, and whether anybody's doing maintenance, CCG. Any, any thoughts on that from the staff?